It goes something like this. We find out that epidurals cause cerebral palsy. <laughs> Those of us who are left over after the legal battles are doing remifentanyl PCAs, and the others become doulas or something else. Thank you, Scott Siegel. No, I'm kidding. Scott Siegel never said that <laughs> epidurals cause cerebral palsy. Now, um, another one of my uh, friends and uh, colleague, Robert D'Angelo, when he saw this on the, uh, on the, the uh, schedule, came to my office and said, oh, future of OB anesthesiology. I can't wait to hear that. Great Swami, tell me what's going to happen. And I assure you it's nothing like that. You will not ooh and awe ah through this lecture, okay? So I'm sorry if that's why you stayed around late this afternoon for the oohs and ahs. The reason for that is when people do that kind of prediction, they come up with things crazy like this. This was in 1955. These, uh, I think sci um, one of the science journals pr predicted that within 10 years we would all be going to work in our own personal hovercraft. And of course, these predictions fall flat on their face. I will do nothing of the sort. I also want to point out that there are a lot of things I know that many of you, I'm sure, think in your own minds, that, you know, what the, how the future will look, what we're going to be doing, even in the near future. And there are things I probably won't cover that you think I should. It's just impossible to do this in 20 minutes. Things like business, for instance, um, and, and the business of OB anesthesia, and reimbursement, those sorts of things. I'm not even going to uh, go there, but those are all very important issues and things that hopefully someone else will be able to uh, enlighten us on as we move forward. So I will cover a few topics, though, when, when, when I'm asked, how do I see the future of OB anesthesia? So here we go. I'll look metaphorically into the crystal ball. I did some rudimentary Photoshop to make that a little bit more accurate there. I am looking into the crystal ball. I want to start with a frightening, what I, what I call a frightening view of the future, proffered to us from the uh, great Professor Eisenach, who is my sometimes office mate, not so much recently, but he used to come to my office all the time and bug me. And one day he did that and he came in and he just said, you know, one day uh, OB, labor analgesia will just be a pill. I don't uh, necessarily uh, agree with that, but he thinks that way because this is his understanding of the pain pathways and the, the, all of the neurotransmitters and interneuronal and neuronal connections that are involved in the transmission of pain perhaps someday will be conquered with pharmacology, but we're not even close yet. So what Professor Eisenach tells us is that Someday, our descendants will look on this picture in horror to think that we once stuck women in the back with this huge needle and gave them these toxic drugs to treat labor pain, much in the same way we look at this picture of our ancestors in horror. This is a medieval trephination where you can see the practitioner is cutting open the skull to remove bad thoughts or whatever they did trephination for. So, uh, like I said, I don't necessarily sh uh, share his view on the future as far as it just being a pill that goes. I think we're safe at least for a while. But I can distill this down a little bit as a segue into talking about adjuncts. Uh, for better or worse, pretty much my entire academic research career involves the use of spinal adjuncts. And a lot of these are familiar to you. A lot of these are things that you've never even heard of, but they've all been tried to varying degrees of success. And I'm really not going to talk about adjuncts per se. That's an entirely different lecture that I enjoy giving. But I do want to use this as a way to, to, to talk about where we're going, perhaps, in the future. This is my simplified version. This is my understanding of, of pain pathways. This is one simple one. In fact, I did draw this myself. And this is a, in, uh, it called a descending inhibitory pathway. You can see the top, the mu receptor agonism occurs in the brainstem. And then you have these neuronal and interneuronal connections in the spinal cord as it descends down. And various neurotransmitters are used to modify the, the pain or the transmission of pain that's coming in from the periphery. You can see there the nerve ending and the DRG uh, uh, schematized as well. So local anesthetic blocks, obviously, by sodium channel conductance right on the nerve. And then things like, we're familiar with fentanyl, of course, the uh, enkephalin receptor uh, is a presynaptic receptor there, clonidine, where norepinephrine is a native neurotransmitter, and acetylcholine, where, or neuroneostigmine, where acetylcholine is a uh, native neurotransmitter. 
So I'm going to talk very briefly about neostigmine, just again as an example of where uh, part of the future of uh, obstetric anesthesia might lie. Now, again, early in my career, in fact, during my fellowship, we were doing the, the phase one studies on spinal neostigmine, and these women uniformly puked, and it was horrible to see. And we abandoned the use of intrathecal neostigmine because of that. However, it was discovered that epidural administration provides that same analgesia without the nausea for some reason. So we presented a few years ago uh, an abstract at the SOAP meeting. We're still working on this. It is a long, laborious study. And I'm not going to go through the details. You just have to trust me that that table shows you that neostigmine is pretty much the same as fentanyl in terms of local anesthetic sparing effect when used as an adjunct in an infusion for labor analgesia. Well, while we were doing this research, it caused uh, uh, Dr. Eisenach to write this editorial called ne Epidural Neostigmine, Will It Replace Lipid-Soluble Opioids for Postoperative and Labor Analgesia? Well, it's a big maybe, of course. The efficacy is well documented already. There is no respiratory depression or itching with it. No concerns for the being a controlled substance for diversion and all the documentation required. Certainly the safety profile looks good so far, but this remains to be tested long term and currently only should be used in the research setting. Uh, some of our European colleagues have contacted me and told me how they are using it routinely. I, I don't suggest it, but uh, I think in the future, maybe neostigmine, but again, this isn't about neostigmine, it's about adjuncts and all of those pharmacologic pathways that are as yet, uh, that have not been um, utilized. And it's just, it's a long road, the research the going through regulatory requirements and safety testing and so forth to do all these things. I think there is a future here though. Ultrasound, I'm not gonna steal any of Dr. Vallejo's thunder. He's giving a talk just about ultrasound and uh, certainly don't want to uh, even try to go into the technique or anything. That's not the point of it. The point is where is ultrasound's place in the future of, of OB anesthesia? And I will briefly touch on that. Now, the hope is that it will assist with difficult placement. There already is some data for this. So things like scoliosis, uh, a patient with previous lumbar surgery or in the morbidly obese patients. I think it's perhaps going to be most useful in the future as a teaching tool. Uh, for instance, we have known for a long time, and we've had to repeat the study because we just don't believe it, I guess, that we are routinely wrong high when we're finding a level, uh, a spinal level. You think you're at L4-5, you're just as likely to be at 3-4 and sometimes even 2-3. Ultrasound is a good way, it's, again, on obese patients or difficult patients to actually find where you are and to, and to teach concepts like that. The, the enthusiastic proponents of ultrasound are hoping that someday safety will be a proven benefit. That's going to take a long time if it ever happens because fortunately for us, these complications are so rare. I'm not sure that that will ever happen. Others, however, are not as enthusiastic for the future of obstetric ultrasound. And I say that tongue in cheek because I'm not sure how uh, much David Gambling, he wrote this editorial, was just playing devil's advocate or how much he really means. But the editorial was titled, Is This a Useful Gadget or a Time-Consuming Gimmick? And in it, he talked about the increased cost that we have to consider, lack of proven benefit, increased overall procedural time, the unproven safety of ultrasound, which of course our obstetric colleagues would argue very strongly against, and I'm not so sure that's a big deal either. But I think importantly, we have to consider that slippery slope of regulator requirements. We're already in a position where requirements are being thrust upon us for uh, ultrasound in central line placement and uh, other places where we need to consider, is this something that we want to be in our future? Uh, Manny, I'll let him talk more about that uh, tomorrow, or I think it's the next day. Now, in the future, perhaps real-time ultrasound will be developed. Now, that could be very helpful. Uh, again, there are barriers for this as well, the big one being that unlike with line placement or with a lot of peripheral blocks, the ultrasound signal and the needle have to share the same narrow window through the bones. And even if we do get a really, really high resolution ultrasound developed that can find the tip of the needle, you would still have to be very good at sweeping and, and keeping that needle uh, in, in the field of view to know exactly where it is as you're going forward. But maybe real-time ultrasound will have a place in the future of OB anesthesia. All right, the next topic is the future 
of labor analgesia maintenance, okay? So here is a very familiar to you, a schematic, a cartoon that uh, I'll use as an analogy for where, we're, where we've been and where we're going in the evolution of labor analgesia. When I uh, started my residency, we were doing intermittent bolusing. And I'm sure many of you in the audience remember, well, pro you probably remember things before, some of you remember things before that, but that's where I started. We would start an epidural, you'd give a bolus of drug. When the patient started hurting again, you'd go in and give another bolus. Then we got these great auger pumps that would just continuously push drug through the epidural to free you up. The first generation of pumps we had were so poor that sometimes we would just go back to intermittent bolusing because it was easier. But then we got PCEA, and that's where it really took off and got good, and that's where we are now. And then on the cusp of the present and the future is PIEB. That's not an accepted acronym. It's just one of the acronyms used for a concept that is uh, up and coming and definitely is in the future of OB anesthesia. That acronym is Programmed Intermittent Epidural Bolus. And so why have we come here? That's an epidural catheter with three ports. And we've known for a long time that when you have a continuous slow infusion through a pump, most, if not all, of the drug comes out of the proximal orifice. If you put that on, use dye through a catheter and put it on a piece of paper, as was done in one of the references there, it will look something like that. Now, if you push the same volume and same dose of drug through that catheter, but do it rapidly so it's under high pressure, then it comes through all three of the ports. And so the dye on the paper looks something like this. The same thing happens in the epidural space, as proven by a cadaveric study by Quinn Hogan. So when you give these higher volumes and pressure, you get a more uniform distribution of the injectate into the epidural space. It simply spreads better with a bolus versus an infusion, even with the same volume and the same dose of drug. And that bears out well clinically. There have been a variety of studies there in 2004 showing, now, now these studies compare, both, both of the groups got PCEA. They were able to hit the button and get more drug. All it did was give the same dose of drug over time, either as intermittent boluses or as one long continuous infusion. So, the advantage of programmed intermittent bolus over infusions are longer time to first rescue, higher patient satisfaction. In uh, Cynthia Wong's study in 06, lower total drug use again, fewer rescue doses, higher patient satisfaction. And another one with less motor block, also lower total drug doses and fewer doses, fewer rescue doses required. So this definitely is the future. Uh, someone during the panel, please correct me if I'm wrong, but last I checked, there is no currently commercially available pump that will do this. Uh, some have made their own, and uh, I think that they are in development. Last time I talked to Cynthia, they still were in development. And then the future beyond programmed intermittent boluses is the smart pump. Here is the Wake Forest smart pump. It doesn't look very smart with all of its uh, use of scotch tape, duct tape, and uh, automatic or uh, little cutouts there. But this was developed by an electrical engineer, you may know, Dr. Peter Pan, who is in our, our, uh, on our faculty. And what smart pumps will do, just generically, what the hope is that they will use a feedback loop from the patient and what the patient is needing over time to adjust those programmed intermittent boluses to make them either smaller or larger over time as the needs of labor analgesia vary. So there will be a future definitely for programmed intermittent boluses and probably also for smart pumps. All right, just a couple of more things. One of them is these visualizing tip needles. Now again, not, that's just like with my acronyms, this isn't really an accepted term. I'm just, it's a way of, of describing a couple of technologies that are being developed right now. Now, don't confuse this with epiduroscopy, where you have an actual camera at the tip of the epidural needle as you advance toward the space. That's been tried, and the problem there is that you have to have an airspace in front of the camera for that to work, and it's very difficult to do in the tissue planes. Once you get to the epidural space, it's fine. You can look around, but getting there is a problem. No, we're talking about a needle that has a tip that uses uh, various methods to detect the physical differences in the tissues as you go through them. Here's one uh, by Jim Rathmill and colleagues. Uh, they call it optically guided insertion. You have a TUI needle. It has three fiber optic, uh, it has three optic fibers in them. All right, one of them emits light, two absorb the light. And so there's this characteristic spectrum that comes back that is indicative of the tissue that you're in. Okay, this may look very busy and confusing, but it's, uh, it is not really, it's quite simple. 
On the left side, you see the CT scans as the procedure is being performed on, a, an, on an anesthetized pig. The needle is obvious as it's going through. So on the top row, you can see what it looks like when you're in muscle. Don't worry so much about the reflectance spectrum in the center. That's just the data that comes back from the optic uh, sensor. But look over on the far right side, and what you see are two columns. One is the blood fraction, and one is the lipid fraction. So as you'd expect, on the top one, when you're in muscle, there's a lot of blood. So you have a high blood fraction and a lower lipid fraction. This is obviously lean pork here. The middle one, interspinous ligament, you've got kind of an equal ratio of the two. And then suddenly, as you go into the epidural space, look at the bottom uh, fractions there, the blood fraction drops way down, lipid fraction goes way up because of the adipose in the epidural space, and it's highly characteristic. And they were very successful in doing this over and over in anesthetized pigs. They even reported one that went into a vein as you went into the epidural space, and there was a sudden increase in the blood fraction and decrease in lipid fraction, as you would expect. Here's a second type of so-called visualizing tip needle. This is an ultrasound probe. And again, this might look at first a little daunting to interpret, but I assure you it's very simple. On the, uh, so you see you have four rows there, and all four of those are a, a snapshot of the output from this device, okay? So this is at four different time intervals. Where the red arrow is there, that is the, uh, the characteristic little waveform of the dura. And beyond that to the right, labeled B, if you can see that, is the subarachnoid space. So on the very far left edge of the graph is the tip of the transducer. And you can see, as you go through those snapshots, it gets closer and closer and closer to the dura. There's also a characteristic uh, notch there where ligamentum flavum is. And then where A is, there's a space where, of course, that's the epidural space in between those two notches. So you can move this transducer closer and closer and watch the output as you get there. And as soon as you get to the epidural space, you can pull the ultrasound out and thread a catheter. Again, in anesthetized pigs, this was very successful. OK, one more thing I want to talk about in the last 2 minutes and 59 seconds, pharmacogenetics. Now, the hope with pharmacogenetics is that we can tailor our drug delivery to the genome. And in fact, semantics there, I should have said pharmacogenomics, but we won't worry about that. And this would hopefully provide us better analgesia with fewer side effects and lower toxicity, and perhaps even lead us to alternate drug choices in certain patients. And to understand this, we have to understand the SNP, or SNP, the single nucleotide polymorphism. We're all familiar with a very famous example, the one that causes sickle cell disease, so you have a single nucleotide polymorphism that substitutes the wild-type glutamic acid for valine, and that causes a normal cell to become a sickle cell when it is in a hypoxemic environment. Similarly, we have a SNP for the mu receptor, which leads to two different populations of this mu opioid receptor. And those two populations of receptor behave a little bit differently. Over a decade ago, we did this study on the ED50, or we determined the ED50 of fentanyl, intrathecal fentanyl, for labor analgesia. And we didn't know anything about pharmacogenetics at the time. And so this was just all commerce, a, a, whole, a complete mixed population of injecting this drug. This is the up-down sequential allocation method. And we determined an ED50 of 18.2 micrograms for fentanyl. So Ruth Landau and colleagues, then took this uh, a few years ago and separated the subjects into wild type mu receptor and the uh, G variant. And as you can see, there are two different ED50s for each of those two types of mu opioid receptors or patients with those mu opioid receptors. The problem is when we try to make this clinically relevant in terms of labor analgesia duration and C-section post-op analgesia, it's a little disappointing. Uh, Cynthia Wong put it well in the title of her editorial last year, the promise of pharmacogenetics and labor analgesia, tantalizing, but just not there yet. So, uh, oh, and she, and she gave us some reasons why that might be. There are a lot of confounding variables, especially with labor analgesia, with age, race, parity, induction versus spontaneous labor, whether ox oxytocin is being used. There are diurnal variations, so night versus day. And then one confounding variable we're all quite familiar with, and that is presence of family members. 
So this is something that I'm not sure, maybe in the distant future, we will have some other things to look at. I think with just the mu opioid receptor, probably not something that's going to play well or play big into the future of OB anesthesia. Oh, I did have one last thing. I'm sorry, I'll be very brief with my last 11 seconds. Pain prediction. So we've known for a while that pain requirements after C-section are variable. So if you give the same intrathecal morphine dose to everybody, you'll have an overdose in some and an underdose in others. So it would be nice to be able to predict who needs more and who needs less. And it turns out that that's not so hard after all. And there are a lot of studies that have been done with various experimental pain stimuli. This is just one of them. This is a thermal stimulus. So you can take a woman who's about to go for C-section. Right there in the holding room, you can put a thermal stimulus on the forearm, and she rates it from 0 to 10 with a VAS score. If she rates it high, it correlates well with her needing more uh, pain, more uh, PCA morphine afterwards. If she rates it low, vice versa. And this is just one, one of the studies showing that. There are a variety of ways of doing this. There is even an auditory test that you can use to do this. Uh, Dr. Pan at our institution has distilled it down to a questionnaire and has validated that. And so you can do something beforehand to predict how much they'll need afterwards and give either spinal morphine concomitantly or, or whatever your therapy is. Okay, so in summary, Isonox pills, maybe, maybe not, certainly not in the very near future, but in the distant future perhaps. Spinal adjuncts, again, research is slow there. It's hard to do, but we're working on it, and I think there is a future there. Definitely a future for labor analgesia maintenance in the programmed ep epidural, intermittent epidural bolus pumps and smart pumps. Ultrasound guided epidural, absolutely, that will be in our future. These visualizing tip needles, they haven't made it to clinical trials yet or nothing's been published, but watch for that. I think there may be something there. Pharmacogenetics, we have a lot of work to do there and maybe in the distant future. Pain prediction, we are already there and hopefully we're going to refine that and get even better at it. So, hopefully you guys weren't expecting to ooh and ah, and uh, like this in 1900, a 100 year prediction, or one, yeah, a prediction 100 years in the future of us all flying around in our own personal little uh, dragonfly hovercraft or whatever. None of that stuff's going to come true, I don't think, not even for OB anesthesia, so I offer a more uh, sober view for you. And I think that for now, we're safe with just going ahead and pushing this uh, big needle without anyone looking at us with consternation.